Well, we turn this afternoon to my talk on the moral imagination and the teaching of virtue. There's been a great deal of talk of virtue and a good deal of these moral imagination uh, in recent decades. Uh, curiously enough, the uh, first time I noticed the revival of discussion of the concept of virtue uh, was at an ISI gathering in in uh, Philadelphia, one of the Philadelphia colleges, about 20 years ago. And I was asked to speak on the topic there, and you may, if anyone, probably there's no one here who was present then, but if you were any such person, you would recognize some fragments of my talk on that occasion uh, surviving in this, this present talk. Moral, moral imagination has also been revived, this discussion of what it means, a phrase that originates with Burke, and Lionel Trilling, uh, took up this phrase with admiration, attributing it to Burke in the first edition of his liberal imagination in 1951, uh, but dropped it from the second edition because, uh, meanwhile, I had published a conservative mind, and I used the phrase there, and that terrified him that he might be identified as a conservative if he, if he referred to the moral imagination, so he dropped any mention of that and Burke from the second edition of the, of the liberal imagination. Uh, a good deal of this talk, though, is rather, rather silly, it seems to me, both of the, the virtue and of the moral imagination. Now, much of the virtue talk is uh, bound up with the concepts of a civil religion. It's a talk of people who uh, not only have lost any belief in the transcendent, uh, but are hostile toward it, and yet realize the need for some sort of governing principle in society or governing of the soul, and therefore they urge a civil religion, a religion of civic duty kind of French Enlightenment concept. Uh, there's a good deal of talk about that in various quarters here. I don't think we'll wash. So nobody is acts right, rightfully out of an abstract devotion to an abstract virtue. It's a much more complicated matter than that. But I'll touch upon some of those things presently. They have, of course, been published over the centuries. Uh, manuals on virtue. one right here, one which is uh, relatively little known nowadays, Dr. Henry Moore's uh, book first published in Latin, Intuitium Ethicum, and then translated into English in, uh, uh, in 1790, some 60 years after it was published. And uh, this is the first English account. An account of virtue, or Dr. Henry Moore's abridgment of morals put into English, uh, very interesting little volume, although not nearly so well known as uh, Sir Thomas Brown's Christian Morals, which is indeed a greater book, uh, published later in, the, uh, later in the century. But it's not really to manuals, valuable though they may be, that we turn for a knowledge of virtue, or, or rather for being moved by virtue. We turn rather to example and uh, to humane letters, rather than to abstraction. What we call the moral imagination, a term introduced to discourse by Edmund Burke, is that power of vision which enables us to discern human beings as moral beings as something better than naked apes. Uh, the Marxist ideologue denies the existence of the moral imagination by taking it for mere fancy. For him, a man is animal merely. Probably it is not possible to attain the moral imagination or even to apprehend it in others unless one is possessed of some religious insights. I think here of a sentence of uh, Eugene Ionescu, the, uh, the playwright. He wrote, history is a process of corruption that is chaotic unless it is oriented to the supernatural. I heard him deliver those words a few years ago in Chicago. Well, in the writings and speeches of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, we find the moral imagination reinvigorated in our time. That power of vision makes Solzhenitsyn a champion of the theological and the classical virtues. Let us attempt to relate Solzhenitsyn's moral vision to the apprehension of the virtues in our bent world. <clears throat> Are there many women in America today possessed of virtue sufficient to withstand and repel the forces of moral and social disorder. Solzhenitsyn raised that question in effect in his Harvard address and on other occasions 
much to the wrath of militant secularists. Or have Americans, we Americans as a people, grown too fond of creature comforts and a fancied security to venture our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor in any cause at all. Confucius told his disciples, the superior man always, thinks always of virtue. The common man thinks of comfort. Such considerations in recent years have raised up again that old word virtue, uh, which in the first half of this century had sunk almost out of sight. Well, in my, in my remarks today, I venture to offer you a renewed apprehension of what this word virtue signifies, and then to suggest how far it, it may be possible to restore an active virtue in our public and private life. If we lack virtue, we will not long continue to enjoy comfort, not in an age when giant ideology and giant envy swagger balefully about the world. So Nixon tells us, uh, uh, tells that to us Americans, but some of our number try indignantly to shout him down. Certain ancient tyrants, we are told, had an ugly custom of slaying the messenger who brought unpleasant news. That, un that tyrannical judgment, nevertheless, did not undo the event. Well, the concept of virtue, like most of the concepts that have endured and remained worthy of praise, <laughs> has come down to us from the Greeks and the Hebrews. In its classical signification, virtue means the power of anything to accomplish its specific function, a property capable of producing certain effects, strength, force, potency. Thus one refers to the deadly virtue of the hemlock. Thus also the word virtue implies a mysterious energetic power, as in the Gospel according to St. Mark. Jesus, immediately knowing that virtue had gone out of it, turned him about in the press and asked, Who touched my clothes? Was it, we may ask, the virtue of Jesus which sports the shroud of Turin? Virtue then meant in the beginning some extraordinary power. The word was applied to the sort of person that we might now call the charismatic leader. By, by extension, virtue came to imply the qualities of full humanity, strength, courage, capacity, worth, manliness, moral excellence. And presently, virtue came to signify as well moral goodness, the practice of moral duties, and the conformity of life to the moral law, uprightness, rectitude. In recent decades, many folk seemingly grew embarrassed by this word virtue. Perhaps for them it had too stern a Roman ring. They made the word integrity do duty for the discarded word virtue. Now this word integrity signifies wholeness or completeness, a freedom from corruption, soundness of principle and character. You'll get that integrity is chiefly a passive quality, somewhat uh, deficient in the vigor of virtue. People of integrity may be the salt of the earth, yet a rough age requires some people possessed of an energetic virtue. When we say that a man or a woman or a woman is virtuous, what do we mean? Plato declared that there are four chief virtues of the soul: justice, prudence, temperance, and fortitude. Of these, the virtue most required in a statesman is prudence, Plato added. To these classical virtues, St. Paul added the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. These constitute the seven virtues of the schoolmen. Against them are set the seven deadly sins, pride, avarice, lust, anger, gluttony, envy, and sloth. Incidentally, when I ask students in classes to identify either the seven virtues or seven sins, they can name, some can name one or two, and some cannot name any of them. Nobody can name all seven. Incidentally, there was a more specific medieval list of the so-called sins that cry out to heaven for vengeance. Uh, they were four, oppression of the poor, willful murder, sodomy, and defrauding the labor of his wages. Four sins that cry out to heaven for vengeance. Such formulas of the cardinal and the theological virtues have been fixed in the minds of many of us either through church teachings or through humane letters. Yet virtue is something more than the sum of its seven parts. 
From the 6th century before Christ down to the 20th century, this word virtue carried with it a strong suggestion of public leadership. The truly virtuous man would assume public duties, the ancients believed. Uh, take these words from Cicero's Republic. What can be no more noble than the government of the state by virtue? Then the man who rules others is not himself a slave to any passion, but has already acquired for himself all those qualities to which he is training and summoning his fellows. Such a man imposes no laws upon the people that he does not obey himself, but puts his own life before his fellow citizens as their law. Well, but the virtuous man, that is, the classical writers, was a leader in statecraft and in war, one who towered above his fellow citizens, a person in whom courage, wisdom, self-restraint, and just dealing were conspicuous. They meant a being of energy and force, moved almost by a power out of himself. How is this virtue, this conspicuous merit and talent to lead, acquired by men and women? That question provoked the famous debate between Socrates and Aristophanes. Socrates argued that virtue and wisdom at bottom are one. When I first read uh, Socrates' argument, I being then a college freshman, this seemed to me an insupportable thesis. For we have, we have all known human beings of much intelligence and cleverness whose light is, a dar is his darkness. And uh, we have known people who are not very bright who nevertheless make this as the virtues. After considerable experience of the world and the passage of more than four decades, to me, Socrates' argument seems yet more feeble than it seemed to me when I was a freshman. Uh, and so it seemed to Aristophanes, the sophists, that is, the teachers of rhetoric and prudence, and Socrates among them, professed that they could teach virtue to the rising generation. Through development of the private rationality, these teachers declared, they could form talented leaders within the state, men of virtue or char charismatic power, endowed with the talents required for private and public success. To the great comic poet Aristophanes, this notion seemed a dangerous absurdity. Greatness of soul and good character are not formed by hired tutors, uh, Aristophanes maintained. Virtue is natural, not an artificial development, in, in the argument of Aristophanes. Who possesses virtue? Why not some presumptuous elite of young men treading effeminately after some sophist or other? The true possessors of virtue are the men of the old families, reared to righteousness and courage, brought up in good moral habits from the earliest years accustomed to discipline and duty. Their prudence and their daring defend the state. Just how far the hero poet Aristophanes uh, believed virtue to be inherited and uh, how far he took it to be nurtured by family example and tradition, we do not know it is removed. But it is clear that Aristophanes uh, laughed to scorn the thesis that virtue may be imparted by schoolmasters. The Greek teachers of philosophy, nevertheless, Aristotle and uh, Plato and Aristotle, eminent among them, refused to abandon their attempt to impart virtue through appeal to reason. A kind of compromise was reached in Aristotle's ethics. There, Aristotle argues that virtue is of two kinds, moral and intellectual. Moral virtue goes out of habit, ethos. It is not natural, but neither is moral virtue opposed to nature. Intellectual virtue, on the other hand, may be developed and improved through systematic instruction, which requires time. In other words, moral virtue appears to be the product of habits formed early in family, class, neighborhood, while intellectual virtue may be taught through instruction in philosophy, literature, history, and related disciplines. The experience of, this, of, of the Romans during the Republican centuries may serve to delineate the two different kinds of virtue. Uh, so it is the period of Polybius. The Roman citizens retained their high old Roman virtue, the product of tradition and deference to example of habits acquired within the family. They maintained the virtues of reverence, seriousness, equitableness, firmness of purpose, tenacity, hard work, steadfastness, frugality, unselfishness, self-restraint, and other virtues besides. All these were habits that grew into virtues. 
Then came to Rome the Greek philosophers, with much abstract talk of virtue. But the more the, the sophists praised an abstract virtue, uh, the more did the uh, the uh, mores majorum, the ancient manners or habits of Rome, sink into neglect. Ancestral ways diminished in power. Ethical speculation spread. Although the high old Roman virtue was not altogether extinguished until the final collapse of Romanitas before the barbarian wanderers, by the time of Nero and Seneca, there had come to exist side by side a fashionable array of ethical teachings derived from Greek sources and a general decay of private and public morals from the highest social classes to the lowest. This Roman experience seems to justify the argument of Aristophanes that virtue cannot be taught in schools. Whether the sprig of virtue is nurtured in the soil of sound prejudice, helpful and valorous habits are formed, and in the phrase of Burke, a man's habit becomes his virtue. A resonance and daring character, beautiful and just, may be formed accordingly. During the Korean War, only one American soldier, taken prisoner and confined in North Korea, succeeded in escaping and making his way back to his own lines. A sergeant named Tate set down his, uh, and his uh, records, uh, his captor's records, as a reactionary. Uh, sergeant Pate, an unlettered man from the mountains of Tennessee, I believe, was possessed of the Roman virtues of uh, the discipline of Fermatas, Constantia, and Frugalitas. His father, Pate remarked, had taught him only two principles. First, if a man calls you a liar, knock him down. If he calls you a son of a bitch, kill him. Uh, ethical instruction, when casuistry might have made Sergeant Pate less resistant to communist indoctrination and less resolute in his daring escape, that is, less virtuous. The virtue, we should remember, is the energy of soul employed for the general good. Intellectual virtue, uh, uh, divorced from moral virtue, may wither into a loathsome thing. Robespierre was called by his, by his admirers the voice of virtue. Now, certainly Robespierre, who justified the slaughter of his opponents by coining the aphorism that one can't make an omelet without breaking eggs, uh, was uh, forever creating a virtue. Virtue was always in a, in a minority on the earth to that murderous prig, the sea green in incorruptible. That sort of intellectual virtue, an aspect of what I have called elsewhere defecated rationality, still rises up perennially in Paris and is exported to Ethiopia, to Cambodia, to any national soil that seems ready furrowed for this poison seed. Intellectual virtue, genus Robespierre, is a kind of delusory, ethical snobbery, ferocious and malicious annihilating ordinary human beings because they are not angels. And that's what Solzhenitsyn saw in the Soviet Union. That kind of virtue, pretended virtue of the Soviet state. The abstract intellectual virtue of the Parisian coffeehouse intellectual, I am suggesting, is a world away from the habitual old, high old Roman virtue. The virtues of the statesmen and the soldiers of the early American Republic were not at all allied to the bloody fanatical virtue that was to arise during the French Revolution. So if we aspire to renew American virtue near the close of the 20th century, surely we will do well to look with skepticism upon proposals for some sort of abstract civil religion. An arid virtue that is intellectual only must be unreliable at best and dangerous often. From time to time in recent years, various educational instrumentalists and progressivists have advocated the public teaching of a religion of democracy that is a public ethic founded upon ideological premises. Uh, such an artificial intellectual contraption with no better footing would be mischievous in its consequences. A false, carping, malicious virtue is worse than no virtue at all. The urgent need of the United States of America during near the end of the 20th century is for a virtue arising from habit and affection rather than um, from ideological preaching. Without such a renewed true virtue, our commonwealth may not endure. I think of the words of Simone Weil concerning our era. Uh, in uh, her reflections on uh, quantum poetry, uh, where she writes, and uh, quantum theory, where she writes, it is as though we had returned to the age of Protagoras and the Sophists 
the age for the art of persuasion, whose modern equivalent is advertising schemes, publicity, propaganda meetings, the press, the cinema, and radio. And this took the place of thought and controlled the fate of the cities and accomplished coup d'etat. So the ninth book of Plato's Republic reads like a description of contemporary events. Only today it is not the fate of Greece, but of the entire world that is at stake. And we have no Socrates or Plato or Eudoxus, no Pythagorean tradition and no teaching of the mysteries. We have the Christian tradition, but it can do nothing for us unless it comes alive in us again, which is what Solzhenitsyn in this way has been trying to do, to make the Christian, Christian tradition come alive again. Well, just so. It is not propaganda, nor productivity, nor intellectuality that has the power to reinvigorate America at the crisis of the nation's state. By virtues our nation is defended. But virtue in this land of ours seemingly never went lay at a lower ebb. The instruments of false persuasion, listed by Simone Dale, the tools of the philodoxers, the purveyors of delusory opinion, have been increased in cleverness since she wrote by the triumph of television. In no previous age have family influence early sound prejudice and early good habits been so broken in upon by outside force as in our own time. Moral virtue among the rising generation is mocked by the inanity of television, by pornographic films, by the 20th century call to the peer group. By example and precept, until quite recently, grandparents and parents conveyed to young people, or to a considerable part of them, some notion of virtue, even if the word itself was not well understood. The decay of family, worked by modern affluence and modern mobility, has rapidly diminished all that. As for the influence of the churches, why, perhaps more of it is left in the United States than in most countries, but in a typical mainline church, an amorphous humanitarianism has supplanted the emphasis upon virtue, Christian virtue, that runs through the Christian tradition. And so we return, finding ourselves in circumstances very like those of the Greeks of the 5th century, we return to the ancient question, can virtue be taught? Well, let me confess at once my inability to, to provide any simple formula uh, promptly applicable for the widespread renewal of the pursuit of virtue. Some people fancy that if only schools would turn their attention systematically and earnestly to this problem, relief would soon would follow. It will not do to become so sanguine. For Aristophanes is right, I believe, in proclaiming in the clouds and elsewhere that, that moral virtue is not learned in schools. If good moral habits are acquired at all, they are got ordinarily within the family, within the neighborhood, within the circle of close associates and youth. Often good moral habits, or bad ones, are fixed by the age of seven, little more than a year after school has begun for the typical child. The early life of the household and the early life of the streets count for immensely much, and I need not try your patience by expiating, expatiating mightily on the uh, sort of character, or lack thereof, formed by the childhood associations and impressions of a large part of our urban population, or for that matter, our suburban population. I do not refer to the 80s sea slums merely. In the affluent household, too, where when parents' opinions and tastes are shaped by incessant watching of television, we need not wonder that children learn the price of everything and the value of nothing. Boys and girls will model themselves, if they can, upon exemplars. But what sort of exemplars? Rock stars and the fancied personalities of the heroes and heroines of the soap operas have become the exemplars for a multitude of the American young people in their most formative years. Rarely are such persons or pseudo-persons admirable mentors. Enjoying the good fortune to grow up before television did, I found when a boy, another sort of exemplar, who taught me by a virtue by example, and to a lesser extent by precept, my grandfather, who died at my own present age. He was a generous and popular bank manager and local public man who had a, a short way several times with bank robbers. Uh, also, he possessed uh, uh, important books and uh, read them in good periodicals and helped to develop my own relish for reading. My grandfather was endowed with the cardinal and theological virtues, the latter in a, in a form somewhat skeptical and heterodox. Uh, by conversing with him and uh, watching him, he all unaware, probably, of the power of his influence upon me, I learned what it is to be a man. At no time could every family provide such an exemplar. 
Yet time was when emulation within the family accounted to more than it does nowadays. My relationship with my grandfather made it easy for me to understand Aristophanes' implicit argument that virtue arises easily and mysteriously among families. My grandfather had many virtues and no vices. I assumed then, somewhat naively, that the Republic had sufficient such leaders and moulders of opinion and on the local level as well as the state and national and would have enough such followers. But perhaps I digress. My point is this. The recovery of virtue in America depends in great part upon the reinvigoration of family. It would be vain for us to pretend that schools and colleges somehow could make amends for all the neglect of character resulting from the inadequacies of the American family of the 80s. With some few exceptions, men and women have acquired their virtues or their vices quite outside the classroom. It comes into my mind's eye a glimpse of Catholic young men in a Jesuit university diligently cheating at an examination concerning Aquinas' on truth. Yeah. Yeah. If, the, uh, uh, if a family continues to uh, decay in its functions, so will virtue continue to dec decline in our society. I offer you no placebo in either the liturgical or the medicinal signification of that word. Placebo, domino, and regione vivora. Nay, but the man and woman brought up without moral virtue shall not be accessible to the Lord in the land of the living. Having turned liturgical for the moment, I venture a few words about the churches. Rather, some people expect too much from the schools concerning virtue, so other people count overly much upon churches and clergymen as molders of virtuous character. For Jeremy Bentham notwithstanding, the church is now the moral police force. What the church always has been, has been meant to do, really, is to offer a pattern for ordering the soul of the believer and to open a window upon the transcendent realm of being. It is true that mastery of the theological virtues ought to follow upon sincere belief, and that sometimes it does so follow. Certainly there would be little virtue in our civilization, and quite possibly there would, be, quite, would, have, there would exist no modern civilization at all, were it not for Christian preaching of the theological virtues. From the discipline of the theological virtues, uh, issues think from time to time, as from the discipline of the cardinal virtues issue heroes. Yet it will not do to expect priest or minister to fill the vacuum left by the disappearance of family, exemplar, or mentor. Now the churches of America, nevertheless, ought to do far more good work toward the renewal of virtue among persons than they actually are performing nowadays. I don't mean that the church should become censorious as it was in Scotland of Nazi's day, or it was in the New England of my great, 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 great grandfather at Plymouth. I do mean that the church uh, ought to address itself less to prudential considerations of the hour's politics, at which business the church usually demonstrates its incompetence, and uh, much more to, uh, to uh, showing the pertinence of the theological virtues to our present discontents, private and public. Certain developments within theological colleges here and there encourage me to think that some such alteration of approach has perhaps commenced. And it is altogether possible that a general widespread renewal of faith in the supernatural and the, the transcendent character of Christian belief may come to pass within the next few years. It might be given a sign. A phenomenon more tremendous than the Great Awakening ushered in by Wesley and others two centuries ago. But to pursue that possibility would lead me to the mysteries of the Shroud of Turin. I must stick just now to my last. However that may be, the present influence of the Christian churches is not calculated to bring about much revival of the concept or the practice of the virtues, either theological or cardinal. Most graduates of seminaries seem not capable today of discussing virtue or particular virtues with much historical or philosophical insight. For the moment, we must not look to institutional Christianity for arousing moral virtue, as uh, de Montvale suggests in the passage I quoted earlier. The Christian moral tradition lies dormant at best in modern hearts. If it is to come alive again, well, probably it must be revived by some outer power. The moral virtue which grows out of habit being difficult of attainment in our era, people turn their attention to intellectual virtue. It was so in the 5th and the 4th centuries before Christ. The fact that Aristotle schooled in philosophy, a future great king, 
did not produce any general alteration of minds and hearts. Finding the old Greek religion and morality in Thebes, and moral habits much impaired, Socrates endeavored to substitute for habitual moral virtue the identification of virtue with wisdom, intellectual virtue. The immediate benefits of this venture of this venture were not obvious. Alcibiades and Critias were among Socrates' more successful disciples. The virtue of the sort was theirs, but not the virtue of moral worth. Yet there had been times when intellectual virtue has been imparted successfully. As such, in British North America, was the second half of the 18th century, when there was developed a class of able persons during, as a class, the late as the 1830s, who knew the meaning of virtue. Theirs was the schooling of English gentlemen of their age, uh, deliberately intended to bring home the idea and the reality of virtue to those members of the rising generation, presumably destined to be leading men of their society, whether in the phrases of Edmund Burke, men of actual virtue or men of presumptive virtue. The distinction here is one between enterprising talents, the men of actual virtue, and inherited rank and wealth, the men of presumptive virtue. And how were such persons in the 18th century schooled in virtue? They were required to read carefully in the classical languages, chiefly in Latin, a certain enduring book that dealt much with virtue. With virtue. In particular, they studied Cicero, Virgil, and Plutarch among the ancients. They memorized uh, Cicero's praise of virtuous Romans. They came to understand Virgil's labor pietas fatum. They immersed themselves in the lives of Plutarch's Greeks and Romans of excellent virtue, men in whom the energy of virtue had flamed up fiercely. Now, it doesn't follow that we, in our time, could produce such a generation of leaders as signed the Declaration and wrote the Constitution, were we suddenly to sweep all rubbish and boondoggle and driver training out of the typical American school curriculum and uh, install instead the required reading of 1775, say. Uh, for that study and reflection necessary for the attainment of intellectual virtue cannot unaided put flesh upon virtue's dry bones. For intellectual virtue to become active virtue, whether after the fashion of George Washington or the, 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 or the fashion of Maximilian Robespierre, uh, for this, a favorable circumstance must occur. In the 13 colonies, the altered relationships between Britain's Crown and Parliament and the dominant classes in America uh, provided opportunity for the Americans schooled in virtue, particularly, though by no means exclusively, the men of actual virtue, to take power into their hands. And by 1832, the last survivors of America's intellectual virtue school of earlier decades, John Quincy Adams in particular, were being thrust aside by men of another pattern. It is possible for schools of intellectual virtue to endure a great while and to exercise a very strong practical influence. In essence, the famous public schools, began with many good private boarding schools of England, have been for centuries the centers for imparting intellectual virtue to boys who presumably have obtained, most in many ways, a good deal a good deal of moral virtue within their own families. Such at least has been the aspiration of the British public schools, represented at their best by the ideas and methods of Dr. Thomas Arnold. The probably the days of the public schools and the boarding schools are generally are numbered in Britain now. The long history of those schools suggests that intellectual virtue was better imparted in England than in Greece. At the English schools, until recent decades, the core of the discipline of intellectual virtue was the study of Cicero, Virgil, Plutarch, and classical literature generally. In the United States, scarcely a school remains, I suppose, but the notion of intellectual virtue still is entertained. A fair amount of the content of such studies, nevertheless, used to be conveyed by literary and historical courses in American intermediate and uh, secondary schooling. That remnant has been trickling away, and not in America only. C.S. Lewis, four decades ago, assailed the corruption of school courses in humane letters in England. He found the new textbooks sneering at virtue of any sort. Great literature used to train the emotions, Lewis wrote 
And uh, here I quote him directly. Without the aid of trained emotions, the intellect is powerless against the animal organism. I had sooner play cards against a man who was quite skeptical about ethics, but bred to believe that a, a gentleman does not cheat, than against an irreproachable moral philosopher who had been brought up among sharpers. Uh, in battle, it is not syllogism that will keep the reluctant nerves and muscles to their posts in the third hour of the bombardment. But all this time, such is the tragic comedy of our situation, we continue to clamor for those very qualities we are rendering impossible, and then hardly open a periodical without coming across the statement that what our civilization needs is more drive, or dynamics, or self-sacrifice, or creativity. In a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function. We make men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. And my quotation from Lewis. Uh, by the way, speaking of card shoppers and gentlemen, uh, the word cad uh, is of that derivation. Uh, a cad is a person who cheats at cards. Uh, that's the, the one offense that anyone who says the gentleman could not commit. He might do all kinds of other things. Very, very naughty. But he must not cheat at cards. There's one mark of gentlemen you know, matter, you don't cheat at cards. The reason being that uh, debts and gambling are not enforceable at law. He might go up very heavily in debt otherwise. He might endeavor to evade his creditors and so on, because after all they had recourse against them in law. They had none in, in at cards, therefore you'd be a really were a cheat. So really a little gentleman if you cheated at cards. That's you a cab, a card sheet. So we are worse off still in the nineteen eighties. So far, what attempts we have made in America to impart virtue, once more, have been confined principally to research projects, usually with plenty of public funds behind them, and that hideous sham called values clarification. Uh, but I am descending into vapor. Uh, can, can virtue be taught? Well, it can be learnt, but more through a kind of illicit process than through a formal program of study. Surely it cannot be taught by those incompetent and comedian-like intellectuals who spoke in and calls the smatterers, the smatterers, the smattering of knowledge. Few seem competent to teach virtue in our republic nowadays, and relatively few hungry sheep look up to be fed. Yet adversity, which we Americans seem liable to experience sharply and suddenly uh, in these concluding years of the 20th century, adversity frequently opens the way for the impulse towards virtue. The terrible adversity endured by decent folk in the Soviet Union forged the virtue of socialism, a hero for our age, an exemplar for our age. Only rags and tatters of the old moral virtue survived in Russia after the triumphs of Lenin and of Stalin. Socialism and some other Russians with moral vision found it necessary to raise up intellectual virtue in the ages of revolution. They have succeeded, in the sense that Socrates and Plato succeeded. Whether their reconstruction of virtue will take on flesh more swiftly than did the Greek reconstitution, we do not yet know. Feed men, and then ask them of virtue. It's a slogan upon the banners of the Antichrist and Slovian's romance. So we have the Russian writer who strongly influenced uh, both missing, both missing come late to him. We have done just that in this republic since the Second World War. Feed men and then ask them of virtue. Nowhere is this more amply illustrated than in Washington. Whether or not virtue can be taught, uh, we have not troubled our heads about it or our hearts. When the rough beast slouches upon us, what Theseus or Perseus, incandescent with the energy of virtue, will draw his sword. I thank you for hearing me and look forward to your questions and comments. Do you think virtue requires a, a, a Judeo-Christian teaching, or the Aristotle for a great souled man, is that you representative of, of virtue? Oh, virtue is certainly risen in many lands under a variety of religions. Oh, it requires, I think, all of the, some sort of religious insight or faith to sustain it. Maybe different religions and 
different cultures. Uh, it's true that the Greek philosophy was not in the long run sufficient to sustain it. Uh, once the old Greek religion came to be taken for fable merely, uh, then there remained only an elite of the a person schooled in philosophy who uh, endeavored to sustain virtue, and uh, more and more the uh, the mass of people were left without any sure guidance. Uh, that development was even more conspicuous, of course, in Roman history, the beginning of the old Roman religion. When the Stoic philosophy, which is primarily concerned with virtue, the Stoic philosophy did, after a fashion, sustain the empire, which otherwise would have fallen. Uh, a handful of uh, men of stern stored virtue and much knowledge uh, scattered them uh, only among the jurist consults for the many po administrative posts and uh, a few of them in the Senate. Managed to hold things together for quite a long time, uh, but eventually that uh, structure collapsed for lack of uh, habitual customary virtue among the mass of the people of the Roman system. And thus uh, the barbarians entered a land, which is a kind of moral vacuum as well as already in part of vacuum physically from the decay of population. So yes, one can have a, a virtue that is not Christian in origin, but if we're speaking of our own culture, one can imagine really no alternative, that is, in a Christian, uh, a, uh, among people who have grown up in a Christian culture, one cannot offer suddenly a clever philosophical substitute and suppose it will take root. Uh, if there's a re-expression and a reinvigoration of virtue, it must have, I think, Christian and Judaic roots uh, within our culture. And there's a much greater authority in that present. Uh, I was asked this question at the Mobile textbook trial where I was a witness in the court. But I, uh, I said, well, you better turn to somebody else about that. In fact, you, I said, you really should have my wife here. She knows more about this than I do. Well, how did you give us a brief explanation? Well, I think there's even a greater authority than I am here, and that is this summer. He's yeah. doing his work in this area, and uh, I think that he can just briefly explain it. Well, yeah, I would not consider myself an expert, but I think it's a great deal. Come over here and take the stand. There's not a question of that. That's right. It's a great deal. I spent several days this week just reading this stuff. Uh, quite simply, values clarification is the view that uh, there are, that it is possible to be neutral, that it is possible to uh, to teach a class, to lead a discussion, and to be totally neutral, that is, to be values-free, and to be a human being and to be values-free, which is the first contradiction that value certification is built upon. The second contradiction that's built upon is that all values are equal. The ideal behind uh, <laughs> the ideal behind value clarification is that what we want to do is create situations in which students discuss their values and discover the values that they have. So, for example, values, a typical values clarification uh, session would have third graders discuss whether they feel more like Volkswagens or Cadillacs. You know, the, the root idea is to get behind their preferences and ultimately to try to uncover some sort of decadence if they like Cadillacs or <laughs> some sort of virtue of you know the smallest beautiful sort of virtue if they prefer Volkswagen. Um, fortunately, the values clarification movement has been pretty much discredited. Because people no longer accept the notion of moral neutrality. That's the good news. Uh, they realize that you cannot be morally neutral once you are engaged in the path of education. The whole... Uh, Kohlberg is another school, really. It's called the Cognitive Developmental School. And Kohlberg's idea is that people progress through certain stages. That there is a natural moral development to the way that people reason about morality. And he believes that, reason, that morality is primarily a matter of reasoning about dilemmas not primarily a matter of, of developing certain dispositions or virtues that guide us in action. Um, so he believes that morality is primarily a matter of reasoning and that people progress in the way that they reason, that there are these stages, they are hi hierarchical, and at the lowest level you merely reason conventionally, but at the highest level you reason using the enlightened ideal of justice, which you find embodied in John Rawls' the Theory of Justice, uh, if you've ever read that, and you do. Um, there are a lot of problems with Kohlberg. One is that he's, he's purported to develop a psychological theory of how people reason, but he's imported a lot of, uh, a lot of normative notions, all right? For example, at one of the lower levels, people reason using utilitarian mode. At the higher levels, they reason using John Rawls' principles of justice. Um, 
So he's already dismissed utilitarianism simply by saying it's a lower level of reasoning than Rawls was here. Um, he did his work initially in 1958, his doctoral dissertation, and he did a study, a very small study of the way that some people reason. He claims, and they were all male, Carol Gilligan in her book, In a Different Voice, Neil Kohlberg for using men only. She claims that this is the, the typically male mode of moral reasoning. Um, and it, the women read yeah, the immoral way. Yeah. Uh, but there, there have been some other studies in Turkey, for example, in Taiwan, which claim to reinforce these moral developments in, in other cultural contexts, uh, these stages of moral development in the cultural context. But really, uh, the theory has really guided the way that the questions are set up and the way that dilemmas are posed, and consequently the answers you get. So that the whole enterprise is almost faded from the start. The other characteristic of Kohlberg, uh, which, well, not necessarily a bad thing as such, but he believes that the way you develop, you move people from stage one to stage two or stage two to stage three, is by presenting them with certain ethical dilemmas and then getting them to discuss them. The problem is that these are hypothetical ethical dilemmas and that they, aren't, they don't bear a great deal of relationship to our ordinary existence and to common life and the way that we normally reason about things. So there are a number of problems, and it's over. And if you want to talk about this more later, I'll, <laughs> I'll talk about it. We're here to do more interesting things. <laughs> One of the points uh, Lewis makes in his Abolition of Man, which I quoted, is that the uh, advocates and the, well, they were the authors and compilers of the new school readers uh, pretend to be value free, no value judgments. But as a matter of fact, they obviously have a hidden agenda uh, which they intend to impose once they swept away all existing prejudices and convictions, then they'll impose their own. Of course, he suspects them of potentially being Marxists or ideologues of one kind or another, primarily are Marxists, who want to impose their own values once they're destroying those, destroying those of bourgeois society. Of course, this endeavor has been going on for a long time. Uh, when I was uh, an instructor in Michigan State um, more than 35 years ago, um, there was drawn up a, a, a you know, exactly the, uh, the kind of a questionnaire uh, which would be administered uh, to all entering freshmen and, and administered the same test to all graduating seniors four years later. This test was drawn up by professors of education and of psychology and sociology chiefly was to test their prejudices and value preferences, a uh, hundred questions or so. Uh, I can give you some samples. Uh, do you think that if you want a thing done well, you must do it yourself, or saw or precept? Now, if you gave, if you answered yes, obviously you were an old fuddy duddy and had the ignorant reactionary parents, because everybody knows, especially in the university, that things are best done by a committee. Um, and a variety of questions like this, uh, which all the the uh, conventional or long established answers, the prejudice would view this wrong by the people who compiled the questions, and they hoped that the university would uh, enlighten you and get you away from these silly old prejudices. And uh, there were one question was, uh, do you believe uh, it's wrong for a brother and sister to have sexual intercourse together? I don't suppose that my colleagues were in favor of incest on principle. It's just that you should have an open mind and discuss these things and the circumstances and so on. You shouldn't be closed. You should be moving into an open society. You should have an open mind in which every wind of doctrine can blow. So why are we governed by these old sexual civilists? Uh, they gave these uh, questionnaires to all entering freshmen and all uh, graduating seniors. In those days, uh, there were relatively few affluent students at Michigan State, and uh, the proportion of students who came from rural Michigan was much higher than it is today. I gave these tests to the questionnaires to graduating seniors and to hundreds of the of my colleagues. They all left the university with exactly the prejudices they had entertained when they entered. The university had failed in its mission. They had no effect whatsoever. Uh, sophistry had not taken hold. I say that would not be quite so true today, but there's then at that time still strong resistance to the destruction of traditional belief in mores. Now, yes, sir. Dr. Kirk, you mentioned, uh, if I understand correctly, you mentioned that uh, the ancient Greeks, of course, had the 
in order for people to get virtues or to learn virtue, uh, they would be attached as young men or boys uh, to follow the precepts of a sophist of some sort. And that they would follow around and that he would become their primary instructor. And they would model and emulate themselves uh, as, as to do what he did and to think as he did. Um, if I can just ask, well, how different is that from the way that you emulated your, I believe it was your uncle or grandfather, who you obviously say that you emulated in many ways too? Well, the uh, difference uh, which is discussed in a number of learned works in recent years, uh, although sometimes exaggerated, the uh, relationship between mentor and uh, boy disciple was frequently homosexual. Uh, the people are not related, and the, uh, well, the, uh, the frequency of this might probably exaggerated in certain 20th century studies, still that was, that was uh, by no means unknown, so fairly frequent. It was not a natural family relationship. On the other hand, it's, it was not regarded uh, per se as a moral or desirable relationship. It was an indulged vice. It was recognized as a vice. Um, well, if you were no flu hack, remember, it was actually kind of the old Spartan king and general, I think his name in a moment, um, who led the Spartan force into a Asia Minor and uh, as a mercenary force uh, serving the internal wars of the Persian system. Uh, in Agesilus, Agesilus. Uh, Agesilus was, uh, like many of the Spartans, uh, uh, was uh, perhaps out of their military discipline, their isolated life, isolated from women, uh, was given to uh, homosexual advice. Uh, he fell into association with a young uh, Persian prince, it is friends. The Persian prince admired him, called him a bell. And so Gesselus, this is given by Thuthias as an example of virtue, Gesselus sent the young prince far away where he never see him again, so he would not corrupt him. Uh, thus the, uh, the Greeks did recognize the viciousness of this, and yet it was a common relationship or a frequent relationship uh, in such discipleship to a uh, to a mentor. Uh, that's was not, uh, was, and uh, Aristophanes, you see, and Pilate is referring to that. Uh, the uh, party of uh, young aristocrats, uh, Alcibiades school, many of them associated with uh, uh, Plato were called the Laconizers, as they were people who admired Laconia, and that is the Spartan domination. And the word uh, Laconizer had a, was a double entendre. And that a person who admired Sparta and Spartan discipline, the Spartan military success, the Spartan laws, on the other hand, who might share the Spartan vice of homosexuality. And that uh, Aristophanes is implying, whether more gently than he does usually, uh, when he speaks of these uh, young men trading effeminately after some model. You know, against the whole concept of the mentor and student relationship, obviously. Yeah, I'm saying that this is kind of the Greek. Book. There, is, there was a danger there which doesn't exist in the normal family relations. Well, there's, of course, there's a great deal of that in English uh, boarding schools, too, not between master and, and pupils, but among the students themselves. There's always been a trouble in English boarding schools. Further, Russell, your grandfather certainly didn't take pay for your instruction. No. And I rather doubt that, that he set himself up as your instructor or your mentor okay. in any way at all. He professed to. You profess nothing in that, in that you merely observe and yeah. analyze. I haven't read the same books, not to look at books. But it's not a deliberate program. Yes, but the um, institutions have decayed or proven false in some, but in many cases. And uh, as I may have mentioned to you earlier, I am melancholy about my conviction, but sanguine by temperament. So I do that from cheerfulness break and occasionally. We had a uh, ISI gathering here two years ago with Dr. Rudridge and myself as the speakers, and, uh, and uh, Rudridge was uh, so convinced everything was going to the damnation of Alwells that I was uh, viewed by the participants as a pillar of hope and cheerfulness by the <laughs> side of uh, Malcolm Rudridge. Uh, uh, well, I do uh, totally despair of this world, as Malcolm Rudridge does. Um, as I suggested uh, briefly there, we may be given a sign. Uh, it might, of course, be a sign. Well, I said, hey, it means the destruction of society by mysterious dispensation, uh, which increasingly uh, the uh, militant uh, atheist girl alarmed at. It wasn't to speak that there being something moral in this at all. 
there are little friends. Maybe there is. <laughs> Maybe there has been a judgment. Uh, I'd like to talk about that, except in a negative way. Uh, but uh, it may be, in short, adversity. Uh, terrible adversity, whether providential or not, uh, may produce a, uh, a renewal of moral understanding and moral vision mm -hmm. according to reform. Or it may be that we shall be, be given a sign. I mentioned very briefly the possibility of the Shroud of Turin. I talked about this just the other day in New York with a group of uh, clergymen. Uh, this is which now would have been viewed as superstition. I was taken very seriously in, in uh, many, many quarters. Uh, recently I helped a sponsor through the Wilbur Foundation a conference at uh, this was Town College, which is a brethren college, uh, of uh, the scientists and the uh, technicians who were uh, almost all of them. Uh, who had uh, formed that team that went to Rome to study the Shroud. And uh, these are people, uh, most of them uh, not churchgoers, only one of them a Catholic, I think, uh, who came to uh, expect the Shroud without exception. And the expectation, this was, there's nothing of the supernatural or transcendent about this, and there was simply a mysterious impression upon the Shroud, and that they, by examining it, just thought about what had made the impression. And they went there with that conviction. And as they told us on the platform there, uh, with a single exception. And that's the exception of a man who hadn't been to Rome but tried to analyze these sa samples and uh, photographs and so on back home in America. He was the only exception. All the rest of them said, well, we can't say what made the impression on the shroud. There is nothing we know of that could have made it. There is no known scientific uh, explanation of it. It's not a scorch, it's not paint. Uh, and it certainly appears to be the impression of someone who died uh, at the beginning of, of it, somewhere around the year 30 or 40 of the, what we call the Christian era, who was crucified and buried. And no other shroud ever has borne such an impression. There is no other such a remains in ancient times. Uh, this is unique and we can't explain it. And, there, and there, these people are, several of them, including Colonel Jumper, who is an Air Force scientist expert in certain uh, technologies. He uh, complained to me with written bewilderment. I go around uh, giving my scientific account of our, of our study in Rome, in, uh, in Torino, uh, and uh, I am abused. I'm thinking it's not when people get up and insult me and shout at me, shout me down saying you're a fake, you're a charlatan, and so on. So why did he do that? I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm just a, 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 a scientist. I'm just explaining what we did. I said, we've aroused the passion for religion and anti-religion. Uh, that it wants, like you say, to be possibly true. They wanted you to say that what we have there in turn is, is somebody's fake. And when you don't say that, they hate you. Uh, the fact that you're committed to no point of view doesn't help save you at all. Because they want someone's committed. Someone who's committed against the possibility of it being anything usual about the Shroud of Turin. Well, uh, the priests of our age, uh, the most who command that is public, uh, uh, public belief, uh, are the scientists and technologists. Uh, when you see on the television or, or here on radio the advertising slogan, Science Says, you and I may know there's a whopper coming, uh, but the public doesn't know. The public says that's true. Science Says. Now, if science begins to say, well, first of all, that they're already saying uh, that we can't explain the way the Shroud of Terra. And if presently science says, well, yes, Something occurred there with a connection we call a miracle. Something unique happened that left this, uh, this impression. And if what some are already saying, although there are, of course, much evidence, so they can only speculate, and therefore they aren't saying it very loudly, what it seems to us occurred here was uh, nuclear fission. Nuclear fission. And the dissolution of the corpse in the shroud. Bam. And if the solution occurred, can that reconstitution occur? Uh, for the first time, of course, in the history of mankind, there's only since the 1930s, the 20s, 30s, really, that we come to realize that what we call matter is deceptive. You and I think we're solid, or the solid flesh would melt, or this stand and table are solid, but they aren't. Uh, the old notion of matter is exploded. So you and I and this table and this stand are all particles of energy, negative and positive, electrical particles held in a temporary arrangement by laws we don't understand at all. And we do know that energy cannot be created by man, it can't be destroyed by man, it can only be transmuted into different forms. And thus, uh, if by 
from transcendent dispensation of uh, the body of Jesus of Nazareth is man. Uh, and as a nuclear fission, the particles vanish, uh, dissolve in short, and then cannot the same power reassemble it, or you or me, in the life everlasting. That's a possibility. We got much closer to this understanding. St. Paul, of course, could say about this, well, uh, it's been revealed to me uh, that uh, we are man is made for eternity and that we shall have bodies uh, and uh, we shall uh, uh, have, uh, we shall rise again. Uh, he could say, well, it's revealed to me. I can't give you any evidence. I just told me divine wisdom, power. Uh, but that's going to say, hey, it happened, I can't explain it. But the children would have to say, of course, a couple of uh, three centuries later, uh, I believe it because it is impossible. I know reason to not explain it, but I believe even because it's impossible. Only God can make it possible. Uh, now it's different with us. It's possible to understand the nature of matter, the nature of the energy, the nature of dissolution and reconstruction. But no mankind never could understand before. If in short, this should be the tendency of things, that the knowledge of the shroud should increase. That peculiar character should be increasingly certified by science. Would you not then enter upon the new ages of faith? Would not then the, the uh, Christian tradition be vindicated? And uh, well, that wouldn't put things perfect at all. At least it does return us to uh, Christian morals and the Christian concept of virtue. Uh, what has gone out of the world, of course, is belief in the old faith. This is a, departed among the Greeks and among the Romans. If that returned, we would have indeed an entirely different plan of opinion with which to dwell. You had something to say then? Well, yes. I was just saying to uh, People who form opinion don't uh, declare that they still won't believe in the face of what to them is overwhelming evidence. That is, nowadays, the uh, New York Times, the blog has published editorial saying the Shroud of Toledo must be a fake. I mean, I said there was a 14th century bishop who said it was a fake, so it must be. The first time the New York Times ever took the authority of any bishop, I don't know, the 14th century. Uh, but they, they wanted to destroy any possibility of discussion of the char peculiar character of the Shroud of Toledo. But if the same editors are confronted by a mass of evidence from these established scientists at Harvard and Princeton and Yale, you know, California, and so on, everywhere, the uh, New York Times bows before that. That's their God. Uh, science, the science of the house. They can't deny it. They the motives of opinion can no longer deny it, and public opinion is accordingly. You always have a, a few militant atheists who will uh, cherish a copy of Thomas Paine's Life, Age of Reason and go about uh, preaching atheism and defiance of all the evidence, but that doesn't affect in general the, the public uh, mentality. People are, most people are doubting Thomas. They want a document, an article, a shroud, and significance by scientists. And, uh, that to them is, is more than simply an abstract proof, Thomistic proof. It's not a matter of formulas. It's something we can look at here. There it is. There's, there's the evidence. It's not an abstract. It's an abstract. No, that's right. There's been so many relics here in the world. Because it's the relics, the major relics, but at the same time, for those who don't wish to believe. Now, I may have been lying at various places in Asia Minor and in the Holy Land and uh, Constantinople and later in somewhere in France, and then in Torino, it's the theory of how the show has been passed about from land to land. They've been lying around these places as a kind of time bomb, really, intended to explode in the, near the end of the 20th century and, uh, uh, and uh, create a uh, renewal of an age of faith, perhaps, or perhaps not. It may be that we never know any more about the show we do now, that simply interest has been raised, nothing more can do be developed, we know only that we can't explain the impression of the show, we never get beyond it which case that I have a large effect. By saying it, it, be, it may well be some thematic sign of that sort, which might uh, renew the uh, order of spirit and of, uh, and of, uh, and of, uh, of, of uh, virtue and, and morals. Yes, I don't wish to leave it without a current, if you don't want to, but I, I will get, I'm going to ask a different question. Earlier in your uh, talk, you mentioned in listing the classical virtues and the theological virtues and the seven habits of sin uh, remark, and how true it is that the very vocabulary itself is largely brought from the scene. Uh, what, is, what is the relation of having the vocabulary and developing the habits? And other, does that give you enough to go on? Does one, are they intrinsically related? Can we 
can we have hope of, uh, or is our experience of of the virtues necessarily connected with having the term so labeled and used? I suppose not necessarily. Uh, word is a kind of symbol, kind of formula for upon the basic one's actions of power. But uh, in every age, I suppose, most people of virtuous habits are not talked very much about virtue or, or okay. understood really. That's, that's the one angle. I'm sure your, your grandfather didn't go around no. pointing out to you the, the virtues he was just about to exhibit. No. Uh, <laughs> and and the other end, of which uh, I confess I'm amenable to, I can't, uh, can there be any hope? I, of what significance, therefore, is it that the, the, the classic words that they form on this cross from the vocabulary. Uh, some such concept must exist, I suppose, in the minds of those who form public opinion and are intellectual and moral leaders in the society. They must have some some such understanding, even though they are in the streets. The preacher must know something about virtue, even if his congregation doesn't understand much about it. Um, so I thought, well, here's an example of how virtue ordinarily operates in Macosta County. Um, during the, uh, the first 87 years of the uh, history of this county, uh, as a county, that is until quite recent, rel relatively recently, in the first 87 years of our county's history, uh, there was no case of unlawful entry of an occupied dwelling, except for two or three cases in which an inebriate had entered somebody else's house under the impression it was his own. <laughs> um, otherwise, no case of uh, action at law against a burglar, robber, or even casual thief. No such case of an occupied dwelling. You might, boys might vandalize an empty house for us, but they would never enter a dwelling and dwelling to be occupied, and therefore somebody's property. This shows a high degree of respect for uh, property and prejudice against theft. Uh, it isn't that law enforcement was any stricter here, I suppose, or less strict, because they don't have much money for law enforcement law. It wasn't stricter enforcement or your harsher penalties, it was simply habit. Something you didn't do, your parents taught you not to steal. Uh, it's true that uh, petty theft went on then and does now. I miss things in my tool shed and so on. Uh, I never miss anything in the house to come in there. Uh, no danger of burglars and so on. Uh, in short, to enter somebody's dwelling, a strong, strong prejudice against that. That's an evil thing to do, and to take property out would be even more evil. They don't do that. Therefore, there wasn't, it didn't happen. Uh, until uh, quite recent years, with a slow decay of the moral order of the county. Uh, and compared to other counties, of course, it's just still a highly virtuous county. Well, these aren't people who think about virtue and uh, give lessons about it. Uh, well, many of them, many of them, well, I'll say a third or half go to church sometime or other, but I can't say they, they were there were frequent sermons about theft or burglary in church. It's an emphasized possession of here. Uh, but there's just a strong prejudice acquired largely from parents and grandparents who people don't steal other people's property, don't force them into their houses. And that's enduring. Well, that's a virtue of, that's a virtue of habit. Prejudice becomes a habit and, and uh, therefore a virtue. Uh, and that's what most people of all ages, I suppose, when they've acted virtuously, they've done not out of, not out of devotion to some abstract ideal of virtue, but out of uh, habits and prejudices conferred by within the family and within the community. I suppose the uh, typical boy in Plymouth, Michigan, where I lived as a boy, uh, would have admired Tom Mix, uh, who is uh, the equivalent of Ronald Reagan. Uh, he was a, uh, a movie actor, quick on the draw. Uh, he always played a virtuous part, and, uh, put down robbers and Indians and so on. Uh, and uh, he would be and he was my hero, too. I, I was less intimate by the movies than most of the boys were. My real heroes were, were literary drawn from the uh, great works of literature. At, uh, when I was seven, my mother gave me a set of uh, select works of Hawthorne, and one of uh, James Fenimore Cooper, and one of Walter Scott. And I already had a large vocabulary, so I began reading them. In fact, my first serious reading, and uh, so these, Scott in particular, but also Hawthorne, and uh, well, Cooper too, in particular, uh, were my sources of heroes, uh, Pathfinder. Uh, Nettie Bumpo, Cooper, and uh, of course uh, we, the heroes, uh, heroic figures in Scott's history as well. Uh, is my uh, idea of uh, of uh, manliness, virtue, 
uh, literary ideal. And that was, uh, of course, in those days, the, the literary conveying of the of, of exemplars is much stronger than now. I have a, something of a collection of old school readers, and I picked up one for a dollar the other day up, in, uh, up north here. And uh, this is a reader of about 1900. And you find the selections in there were reviewed as very difficult for graduate schools nowadays. People like Prescott, and Bentley, of course, and the great men of letters. Uh, and a, a great many of the uh, stories are, of course, of heroes, those in American history and other things. Uh, all students read them there. All this is, this is the, uh, the um, sixth grade reader. And they, all students read this work and they were examined on it. And it's, uh, now, you may not exactly plan to teach virtue, but it does. It's a virtuous example. It's not uh, overly didactic. It doesn't draw you long lessons about it. It's, a, it's good literature and has a good effect. Taken for granted then, and everybody read it, so it had an influence. Well, of course, I was uh, brought up before there was any television at all. Uh, at least when I was a boy, the only, even there were radio existed, you had to put on earphones and nice, like yourself and the rest of the household and so on. So it wasn't nearly as powerful then. And, uh, Radio production itself was much more strongly influenced by literature, accepted good literature than it, uh, than it later became. The movies uh, at that time, well, certainly some of them were shocking, uh, uh, but in general they are on the side of, uh, of virtue. The public liked to see virtue triumph in Western films and elsewhere. Uh, there was no black comedy, uh, there was no mockery of uh, convention and, uh, and prejudice. By and large, uh, the Movies might be shallow enough, but silly, still aren't as shallow as they are now. Uh, and there, so far as it has an effect upon character, it was for good rather than, than for evil. Uh, that's not, it wouldn't be a smart thing, of course, to do now, smart in the bad sense, the word smart. Uh, the producers of, of the the mass media assume that people want something that is snickering and mocking, which they themselves, the producers, like. Eventually, perhaps, the taste of that wears out, even when it produces. Yes, of course, we do need to apprehend, say, Rudolf Otto's idea of a holy. Nothing to do with more good. Uh, but how does one get there when the current of opinion, of course, is in a quite different direction? Thus, uh, what's come to be called American liberalism uh, assumes that uh, a kind of progress of liberation must be constantly go forward, uh, that we must be emancipated from old uh, restraints. And presently this becomes an argument that anything which we can fancy uh, ought to be a right. If it's a right, then it ought to be free. And if it's a right and it's free, presently it ought to be made compulsory upon, uh, upon everyone. Uh, say abortion on demand is a case in point. That begins with an argument that the women should be free not to have children. Uh, that once that is uh, achieved, then the argument is, well, it shouldn't be made to pay for it. It ought to be a public expense if it's a right. That comes on. And then you hear in, in quarters the president's argument raised, although now of course diminishing in force. Well, uh, since it's a right and it's free, it shouldn't be made compulsory. Uh, shouldn't there be compulsory population control and uh, birth licenses and so on? Well, yeah. as, as in China. And there is but so much in the way of technological and scientific development. You know, if a thing can be done, it must be done. It comes to the man of any scientists. If we uh, can, uh, through uh, our knowledge of organic chemistry, create monstrous creatures, perhaps we, then we must do it. It's our moral duty to press this on us uh, forward as rapidly as we can. Uh, in short, the mentality itself uh, that demands novelty, experimentation, and liberation from all restraints uh, must be dealt with here. Uh, and the question is what uh, restraints upon such experimentation can be imposed. This would not live in a uh, Time of the public opinion, the more favorable to some restraints than formerly. We find some people in Congress worrying seriously about this in other quarters and in serious scientific quarters. And for the first time, uh, political liberals need to worry about it somewhat. Consequences of unrestricted experimentation. Okay. So that uh, certainly, the, uh, for the first time again in uh, human history, 
we have uh, possibilities of destruction of human species uh, by uh, both excesses, moral excesses, and by uh, technological means. Uh, we're in a time when, again, the phrase of Edmund Burke, the file affords no precedent. The file affords no precedent. We've never had to deal with these difficulties before. And we have to deal with them in a time when our moral understanding, our moral imagination are much decayed, and that's why the vision of men like Sultanus and matters so much. Thank <laughs> you.